Hello and welcome to Two Girls in a Pod. I am Sharon. I am Christy. Welcome everybody. We hope that you are doing fabulous. I feel like I'm doing fabulous. What about you? Yeah, it's been a really good day, I feel like. I do too. And we've got to talk to some really amazing people and we always enjoy that. Mm -hmm. One of the things is we've been talking about is we're trying to change our thought processes and it's like having more information in, in learning more really helps us on this journey. You know what I mean? And so one of the things is you're reading this really amazing book. Yeah. And in reading this book, it's something that goes along with a lot of what we do on our podcast and just stuff we do even in our personal life. Yeah. And we always talk about being the authentic self. So when I saw the name of this book, I was really like thrown off by it. I'm like, I don't know about that. It's called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. But I think even in that title, we think, what does that mean? Kind of like you did. But I think when we're talking about that, we get used to this version of ourself and we have to break the habit of that version we have of ourself because sometimes it's not our authentic self. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of who we think that we are because we have built that image of ourselves based on so many different things. Well, I think even when we're coaching, one of the things we're talking to, pe to people about is the people we come all across in our lives from the moment we're born, you know, all these people are kind of giving information or their version of what this is or what that is. And oftentimes, you know, when people are thinking, oh man, this is what success looks like for me, or this is my goal. Well, you just get married and you do this and you do that, and then you're not happy. And then you go and you get a degree and you do this and, and you're not happy. And do you know what I mean? A lot of times we don't realize how much of our life is scripted. And it's not our script. Exactly. So then as this is happening, we start to create this, these neural pathways that are firing and saying, Oh, no, you do this, you do this, you do this, because it, uh, our brain likes patterns, it likes doing these things. But the thing is, is in those patterns, too, we find that sometimes it doesn't resonate all the time. And, we're, and we question, like, why am I having this feeling? If, if this is what I'm supposed to do, shouldn't I be feeling this way? Mm -hmm. Oh, I've achieved this and I have this kind of excitement or whatever. But paying attention to your body and those little incongruencies can give you a lot of information. And I think sometimes people forget our body is really this uh, incredible thing that gives us messages that we often are overlooking. We will not pay attention to them. Yeah. We will do and do and do and we'll be having these feelings where they're like, I don't know what that is. But we don't all always pay attention because it's kind of outside of our awareness. Yes, exactly. But when you start putting it in your work, so one of the things is, is even when I work with little kids, if they're anxious or if they're getting anxious or if they're getting mad, I'll tell them, what is your body telling you? They'll be there like, what does that mean? You know, I don't know. I'll say, well, what do you feel before you get mad? Is there something going on in your body? And a lot of times they'll say, well, my tummy will tickle. Oh, really? That tickle of the tummy is an indicator that something's about to happen. Because remember, we have a thought, that thought is still there first, but we don't, it's not in our awareness yet, but it is in our body's awareness. I mean, I've come a long way from, you know, like even having road rage or those kinds of things. But I remember when I was younger, I remember having this feeling before I would get like super angry about something, there was almost like this little ping that would happen. I, I don't even know how to explain where it would happen, if it was in my head or if it was here in my chest or what it was. But I, almost like I would describe it as almost like a rubber band, like somebody snapped a rubber band. And, and it was like at that moment, that was that emotion was so strong and that anger had been set off. And it's so interesting because I can look back at that now and I don't know when the last time was I had that feeling. But just paying attention to those little things. It's interesting because when you do, in our body, sometimes that physiological thing will manifest itself if we continue to do the same thing over and over. And sometimes, you know, I'll tell people you can get sick. It's sometimes our body will tell us it's time to slow down, but we're not listening. 
-hmm. We're not listening. We somehow think that what's going on up here is different than our physiological or our mental or whatever, that it's not intertwined. It's all intertwined. And I think that sometimes when we don't pay attention to that, and I know even when I, when I got meningitis, my body was already giving me indicators that I needed to slow down. My stress was extremely high at that time. I was trying to meet the needs of my clients. Your dad was sick at that time. We were making trips back and forth to Alabama. I knew that you, this was very difficult for you. So I was trying to hold all that together and I wasn't paying attention, but my body, like I would start having almost a headache before the thing happened, or I just felt off. Mm -hmm. I was just there like, oh, it's because I have a lot to do. Or, you know, you kind of minimize it or you try to rationalize it. But it was my body telling me I was reacting to the, I was having these emotional responses and that I needed to slow down in order to kind of learn to navigate better, you know, and I didn't, but it slowed me down for quite a bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. When the body sends a strong enough message, you have no choice but to recognize it. Exactly. But when we start to identify those things quicker, and oftentimes people will not even notice. And so I had this little kid and I would go in and observe him because he would have, he had a few anger issues. And so I'd go in and watch him and I would be there like, and they would say, we don't know what the cattle is. There's nothing going on, blah, blah, blah. And so I'd watch him because I'm trying to figure out what is going on here. But anyway, as I'm watching him one day, I would, I noticed even before his hand was doing this. His hand was doing this and I'm watching. I'm thinking, hmm, what's this? How's this going to play out? Well, it didn't play out well. He lost his crap. But that was great information for me because his body was giving him a, a message. Before anything happened, he was doing this. And so then I told him, I said, you know what I noticed? What? Before you got really mad and threw stuff, your hand was doing this. Do you notice you do that? He goes, no. I says, well, can you pay attention to it from now on? And then he did, and he would notice that when he was getting mad, he was doing this. And so he could learn that if he was doing this, then he would tell the teacher, I need a timeout. Mm -hmm. His body was giving him a message. Right. He just didn't notice it. Well, none of us did. It just that day I was, I was getting tired of going back. But no, that's what it was. All it was, he was doing this. And he was, it was like, it was building. Yeah. And some people will say they have a physical. So people who are having panic attacks, the thoughts there, they don't know what the thought is, but guess what their body's doing? The it, heart palpitations, sweaty. It starts with the palms. As soon as you feel that your body's giving you a message that your think, your thought processes are going down this path. Yeah. So if you start to have that awareness because these things are done more in the subconscious area. Exactly. Okay. There's a lot going on in the subconscious. And I think that's one of the reasons you've really enjoyed this book. It's got some great information. Mm -hmm. It's talking about getting in tune with realizing what's happening subconsciously before you even have the thought or the emotion that really drives it forward. Because then you take action based on that. But there's these physiological things that happen even prior to that are clues. It's a telltale sign of, of where it's going. And even just being able to identify that, you're able to take some power out of it. Exactly. And I think that's the thing. Well, I don't know. I can't control it. Of course you can control it. I always love when people tell me that. Well, I can't control that. I said, really? Do you lose your crap at work? No, you're not supposed to. Do you do that at school? No, I don't want my friends to think I'm this. Okay, then you can control. Oh, you never got mad at school? Well, of course I get mad at school. And I work with it. Of course I do. Well, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. If we can't control it, mm -hmm. it does not control us. And I think when we're looking at that, our body is set up to help us even. Yes. <laughs> but we get so caught up in that pattern that I think even when you're having that physiological thing, it becomes your normal. So you don't even make the association that physiological thing happens prior to this thought process into this emotional thing, into this behavior. Mm -hmm. 
It's because we're not paying attention. I think a really good example, they will say, don't sit there and eat out of the bag of chips in front of the TV while you're doing it mindlessly. You're not even paying attention to when you are physically full because you are mindlessly eating. So I think that's a really good example of that. That's actually a, a great example. And I think we are constantly doing stuff mindlessly and therefore we don't understand You'd say you do that for a month and a half or something of you're eating your chips mindlessly while you're doing it. And then you get up one morning and you say, holy crap, what happened to my pants don't fit? fit? (laughs) When did this happen? (laughs) Once again, it's because we're mindlessly doing things and we're not paying attention. And it really is, is we have to slow down the thought processes. We have to learn how to quiet the brain a little bit. And I was asked this question on Noon Vibe. They said, what is something really five minute you can do? And I tell them one of the things is, it's an easy thing, is if you can step outside and just look at a tree or something outside, usually if you have a tree, it's really good with a tree. And you just look at the tree, you focus on the tree, you listen and you focus on it. And you don't have thought with it. It's like you just watch the tree, what it does in nature. You don't prescribe oh, well, the wind's really blowing that. I wonder if it's... No, you don't do any of that. You just simply watch it. Be present with it. Mm -hmm. Listen to the sound and focus only on that. And guess what? When you walk away, your brain is quiet. And I would do this often with my clients. I'll do it even sometimes in between my clients. Sometimes I'll just look out at my tree if I'm not listening, but I'll just look and watch or I'll watch the hummingbirds or... You know, I just do something like that to shift me from one client to the next client Mm -hmm. to to slow everything down so that when I go in there, I'm in this place of I'm very attentive. I'm very focused. Mm -hmm. It's important to be able to do that because if your mind is so bombarded with you're either coming up with solutions or you're thinking about what you're going to wear tonight or you're I mean, you're constantly your brain is constantly going So if you take that moment to do that, to observe something like that, I think that the more that you do that and practice that, you can actually become more of an observer of yourself and your own behaviors. 100%. And when I have more of that awareness to me, then I'm aware of my interactions with others. Exactly. Because I'm not just spouting off crap because of that emotional drive internally to me that triggers this, that, or the other, whatever it is. Once you are able to do that, when you have more of a conscious awareness to what's going on with you and you realize too, I don't like the way that feels, then you have the opportunity to change it. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're feeling that way because of something someone else does or that, then it gives you that clue that you need to maybe set a boundary or do something like that. And sometimes it's even set your own boundaries with yourself. Yes. It's not even so much about somebody else. It's like, okay, I am agreeing to not do this because I'm gonna, I'm going to set this time for me. I'm going to be more introspective or whatever it is. It's something that's easily learned. You can learn it, but you have to unlearn something in order to learn this. Yes. It's the unlearning part that's hard. So that's one of the things that he talks a lot about in this book is you, you have a lot of memorized responses that we use throughout our lives in all situations. So it becomes being aware of those and then being able to unmemorize those common ways of responding because it's what you're used to. Well, when I do couples, I'll see that and they'll say, I already know what they're going to say. And you know what? Nine times out of 10, they're correct. Mm -hmm. And I said, but guess what? The reason that they say that is because you keep saying the same thing too. You keep having the same behavior and all of that. So you're always constantly just going back and forth doing the same thing. And I said, give a different response. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. But I'll also say what is happening because you already have that, regardless, not even understanding that you already have that thought of, I already know what they're going to say even before they say it. Because you already have that, you're already having a physiological response to it. You're already starting to get upset because in the conversation hasn't even started, or you're starting to feel that tickle or that tingle or that snap or that yeah. whatever it is. The angst in the gut. Yeah. <laughs> the gut's going to school. Yeah. 
not a good feeling. No. And as soon as that happens, you go back into the scripted stuff. Mm-hmm. You didn't do this. Well, neither did you. Or this is, your, you have it too. It becomes that tit for tat. And then we get caught up in it. Mm-hmm. So then nothing gets done and we're not really listening. And how many times I even have people say, I get so frustrated because when I'm talking, they're not listening. Mm-hmm. And so they automatically know. So they dread the conversation. They have a physiological response to it. Oh my God, I can't even take it. I'm already feeling all full. I feel like I want to throw up. Don't make me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, seriously, you didn't throw up the last time and you had this every time. Now, how do you change that? How do you listen to that and know, oh my God, I'm going to have this. Okay, wait a minute. Do I have to go to that thing of, oh, this it's going to, I'm going to say this, they're going to say this. Well, then I teach them, say something different. Yeah. And it changes the script a little bit. Yeah, because you're stuck in a loop because you're doing the same pattern response that you've always had. You can't expect something different if that is the case. That's why you know what they're going to say, because you're saying the same thing, too. And once again, it's having that awareness to pay attention. And this book is a great resource for that, to, to learn more about it, to go more in depth about it. It is a long, when we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, it's changing the thought pattern. If I change a thought pattern, it changes responses and it changes more. So it changes how I am going to feel and react and respond. Exactly. And that, I feel like it's really cool to, if you are interested about the cognitive behavioral therapy, I mean, it really does go in depth of explaining how the mind works and how we create those those ways of thinking and how we get so attached to it. It's because there is physiological things happening and how we can reprogram ourselves. It's like a reinforced. Mm-hmm. So what we don't realize is when we keep doing the same thing over and over and we're reinforcing it, what happens physiologically reinforces it. It works the opposite too. So if I'm doing something that I really love and I'm excited about, I'll have the physiological thing almost before I think about it. I might have that excited feeling and then I'll be there like, I wonder why I'm excited. And then I'll start thinking about it. Do you see what I mean? So it works both ways. So the more excited I am and the more I have that pleasurable feeling, the more I'm going to do stuff to have that pleasurable feeling. But I have to have an awareness that I'm having that pleasurable feeling. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. the same thing. I have to be aware of it. Yeah. So it works both ways. You're reinforcing that. Anything that we're doing that we're reinforcing, it's kind of like when you're learning a new task, you practice it as coaching. We have you write stuff. We have you read stuff. We want that reinforced. We have you say stuff. So we're working at different parts of the brain in order to reinforce whatever that is that you want. Mm -hmm. And then paying attention to what's going on physiologically when you do that. Mm -hmm. Because you've been doing that for so long. It is commonplace. You will continue to do it. So then when you're able to recognize it and then you start repeating the new behavior, the new thoughts around that, then it creates a stronger thing for you to be able to take different action. And I think the other thing is when we're trying to change a behavior Because we have that physiological piece that we're not identifying or looking at, that physiological piece sometimes is our driving force and we don't realize it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's even when we look at addiction, sometimes you have that before you even have the thought maybe to have the drink, it might be five o'clock. So internally, your brain already knows it, even if you're not aware of it. So therefore, you start having the craving. Yeah. And then, you know, your thing, and then you might... Then look at your things and say, oh man, it's 445. I get a drink in 15 minutes. But your body already had the physiological, but you did not have the awareness to the thought. But the brain, the body itself had the memory and knows that. Your body knew what time it was, even though you had no idea. (laughs) I always love that. You know, when I do chunking, so when I'm there and the way that I know when we're ready to move to the next uh, increments is the body... They don't even have to look up the body. It, it's amazing. The brain working with the body, working with the brain. If they, a few seconds before, without even the timer going off, they'll put the pencil down. Timer goes off. The body already knows. 
it's having a, it already has a physiological thing. So the body sends the message almost. Mm -hmm. I get to get up and I got to move around. I get to, I got to be what I got to do, whatever, but that's what it is. So I guess the thing is when we start to understand that we have this relationship between our mind and our body, it's such an intricate relationship. It's a really great relationship, but it can also be detrimental and toxic even at times. But once we gain that awareness, we can then change it. We can really pay attention. And when we can pay attention and we can change it, then we get to rewrite that script and really look more towards that authentic self that we are. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're talking about this journey that people are on, it really is learning these little things as we do all the time. We're, we, we read a lot. We're learning a lot. And continuing to, and we learn from the people that we engage with. So it becomes this partnership. And that's what this is. But I tell people, the thing that you should know the most is your brain and your body. Yes. Paying attention to that relationship. Paying attention to what is going on. Mm -hmm. And if it's not feeling good, what do, what can I do to to change it? Or that's just the way I always feel. How sad. Right. We don't want that. We know that there's something, you know, that's being, we're being ineffective and the body is feeling that. And that's why we're unhappy with the situation. So we want something to change. But in order to do that, you have to pay attention to your body and what's really going on. Because once again, when you're having that physiological reaction, you have to work on changing it to not the thought. Because sometimes those two will be in conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the mind is telling you, you should react one way. Oh, I want to, whether it be about somebody else or whatever, but the gut knows that oh, this doesn't feel right. I still am not having my needs met in some way or something like that's creating that incongruency. Exactly. And I think a lot of times, you know, people are told, oh, your intuition. Oh, that's not right. No, you, that's not, yeah, we, we will discount people's intuition or I feel this, oh, it's probably nothing. You know, I mean, we do that constantly. So then what happens is people learn to doubt themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's probably nothing. <laughs> you know, and I tell people, no, get back in touch with that intuition. It helps us. It helps guide us sometimes. And sometimes the intuition will take us away from that. If that physiological thing, intuition will say, mm, don't go down that path. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be good. We're having a physiological reaction too, and we may not even know why. But once again, these are those things that are done on that subconscious. So by the time I'm having that intuition or that physiological thing, my awareness to the thought is behind that. It's slower than that, even though it's very quick. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if it, it's longer in the body, remember the brain is operating at a very fast rate. So it's instantaneous, like, or it feels instantaneous, but it's not. There's all these cues that are happening prior to, uh, to us having a reaction and a response sometimes. So it's, how do we do that? How do we change that? We start to become more aware mm -hmm. of not only what I'm thinking and feeling, but up here, not, I'm not talking about the emotional feeling, but what's going on physiologically with me? Yes. That's the first sign. I can't tell you how many times, you know, when people are in my office, they'll be achy a lot of the time or this, I'll be there like, hmm. or I love when people come in and they'll tell me stuff. I'll say, uh, you do know you're anxious, right? What do you mean I'm anxious? But I can tell by some of the physiological stuff that's going on. And then as we start talking, well, when this happens or when I have this thought, I, you know, I start getting jittery or those kind of things. Well, does that jittery feel good? Well, I never thought about it. I just thought that it was just normal. Yeah. We normalize. And I think that's what the book talks about when we're talking about those scripts is we normalize stuff and we just accept it as, oh, that's the way it's been. That's the way it's always going to be. Well, it's like you said, the brain likes patterns. So, and when, when you're in a pattern of responding the same way, as so that's why I say, if you're expecting a different result, it's not going to work out for you. 100%. And I think that's what we are working on with people is how do we change those patterns? Yeah. How do we also identify is 
was this pattern prescribed to me or is this truly a pattern that works for me because it's something that resonates with me and to learn to separate those out because it's such a, a tight relationship. It's such a strong belief that, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do. Well, sometimes we don't realize that we create those patterns out of survival. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then we keep that pattern, even though we don't need to, the next situation, we don't need to survive. But guess what? Then we will, in those next things, be using the same technique, which doesn't work. And then we don't understand why that relationship's not working. Or if there was mistrust, well, I can't trust. But our brain says, yeah, you can trust this person. But then internally, we're sabotaging. Yeah. Because that fear that we feel will, will feel internally mm -hmm. first. And then the thoughts come in them pretty soon that we keep those thoughts going until it works us up into a frenzy. And then we have that behavior where we become attacking or whatever that situation is. Mm -hmm. Because by that time, the emotion takes over. And I think the thing is, is that we have a lot of these things that work against us. We have all these different, it's really interesting as I'm reading, the book I'm reading is The Audacity to Be Queen. And one of the things I like about when she's talking in there, she labels all these things, the saboteur, the martyr, the victim. And when you start to identify with those, then your body, everything that we do falls into some of these alignments. So that's another really good book to read because it, it kind of goes, it's going hand in hand a little bit with the book that she's reading. So we can talk about this. But it is, she does a great job of identifying these, these things that are so ingrained in us, we don't even know they're happening, mm -hmm. but we're doing it because we were told, you know, oh, you're a nurturer and you, that's what you got to do. I don't want to be a nurturer. Oh, yes, you do. And then other people are saying, oh, well, you just take care of people, okay? Mm -hmm. And you go back into that role. But physiologically, you feel sick. Yeah. It's not sitting well with you. When you go to a job you don't like, you feel sick. You, and then, then the thought, be, then you'll say to somebody, oh God, I hate my job. And then it's like, oh, didn't you just tell me you feel sick? Not understanding those two things are going hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things of how do I pause long enough to really sit down and really think about these things? Because at the end of the day, it sucks when we're carrying somebody else's burden. It sucks when we're living somebody else's life because when we're living somebody else's life, we always are going to feel that little bit of incomplete or, okay, I reached the pinnacle. Is this what it is? Now what? Yeah, exactly. Our body is used to living in anticipation of something too. And we kind of seek that out because it it is gratifying in some way. And it's interesting because sometimes you can be in anticipation of an event. Maybe it's something that you really want to do. And then when it actually gets here and stuff, sometimes you almost feel like it's kind of anticlimactic in, in some ways because it's like it was the anticipation of it that was such a driving thing for you. It was more of the excitement piece of it. Yeah. So you kind of, that's why it's really important, I think, to really pay attention to the body and see how that all works. It's like you say, it goes hand in hand. Well, and when we start to identify that we're not this, it's not like my head walks different than my body. <laughs> it's all together. Mm -hmm. you know? We're not just responding to external things happening to us in that way. We could take our power back. I agree totally. And I think that's what happens is we get so used to the external stimuli that we're not paying attention to the fact that sometimes it's not even relevant to me. Mm -hmm. People get all worked up over. It's amazing what people get worked up over. And, I'm, and then I'll say, I'm sorry, how is this impacting your life directly? It's not, but it's this, I'm okay, but how is it impacting your life directly? But it's not, and I'll say, oh, but it is. The fact that you just spent 20 minutes ranting, raving, I can see your your blood pressure going up and all of this happening. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you, it is affecting you because mm -hmm. you're allowing something that really is not relevant to you become very relevant. But we do that because whether it's taking up a cause or whatever it is. You feel some type of responsibility to it. 
I think that people will do that a lot of times because they think it's a way of showing that you have care and compassion for somebody else because you're so upset about them being wronged or whatever it is. And then we feel like it's the savior. Mm. And then it's, well, why am I doing that? What is my body telling me? Why do I feel like I have to go into this role? And sometimes we don't even know where it comes from. I had this client and it was so, he was so fascinating because one day I told him, I said, you do realize that you feel like it's your job to go help all the damsels in distress because you were so elevated onto this pedestal that you, it made you believe this is your role. Mm -hmm. And he stopped and he said, what? And I said, and when you don't do it, it creates an anxiety in you. It creates a physiological response. And he goes, oh my God, I wait, let me think. And it took him and he, and that was like this turning point for him. He goes, oh my God, you are right. He goes, I feel the need to do this. And I don't even care who it is or how it's going to impact my other relationships. I got to go out and I got to do this. And it's like, that's not working. And it's not even yours. But once, and then once we were able to sort through it, physiologic, everything changed. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, understanding it's looking at something from a different perspective. Is it my perspective? Is it somebody else's perspective? And what is it doing to, what is happening in my body too, when all of these things are going on? Yeah. I, I'm not one for conflict. Well, first off, I, I feel like I'm okay with communication. I'm okay with that. But for c conflict, I'm just there like, if it's not going to change, and if we're not going to be productive, why are we doing this? Is kind of my attitude sometimes. Mm -hmm. She says that to me all the time. What do I say? No. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> once again, I'm always trying to all have the communication piece of it. But that I think it's that's how we have growth and development. And it's like, but how are you feeling? What do you, what does that feel like? And even sometimes when you tell somebody. I felt something with you. And sometimes it's you're feeling them internally and they're not even aware of it. And I love that because we'll do that back and forth with each other sometimes. And we're not aware of it until it's brought to our attention. Then it's like you sit with them and say, oh yeah, maybe I was kind of complaining about this or that, or maybe I there is, I am a little out of sorts. Mm -hmm. Intuition is real and energy is real and you will feel feel those things on people a lot of times you can feel their angst or and it's something that you should just be aware of and I think with this episode in particular it is about how do we be aware how do we understand there is this direct relationship between what we're thinking and what is physiologically happening with us mm -hmm. and how do we make that relationship more in alignment to what it is that I want? Mm -hmm. How do I stop some of those things? How do I pay attention, not only to the thought, but what's physiologically happening to me? Mm -hmm. And how do I take that power back? And how do I discern what is mine and what is not? What resonates with me and what doesn't? And sometimes when it doesn't resonate with us and we have to get rid of it, it's not getting rid of it. It's not a negative. It's just that it doesn't serve a purpose any longer. I appreciate what you brought to my life. You have gratitude for it. And then you just kind of say, okay, when I'll buy. That was a learning experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we all had some of those. Yeah. So these two books are some great resources for that. The Audacity to be Queen. I love that. And of course. Breaking the Habit of Being, being Yourself. yourself two really great resources and also understanding that when we're talking about cognitive behavioral, the CBT stuff, we're talking about changing the brain. And I love in this too, he talks about neuroplasticity. Yes. Historically, they thought neuroplasticity stopped at the age of seven or some adolescent young child age. And now we're actually understanding that neuroplasticity does not end there. And what that means is we can change things. We can still learn new tricks. 
Yeah. You can, how many times have we heard that though? You can't teach an old dog new tricks or, you know, when you get to a certain age, you just don't remember, you don't learn or you don't do this or you don't. So we perpetuate that in our society and it's not true. Mm -hmm. But if you prescribe that to yourself, you will definitely wholeheartedly believe it and you'll never challenge yourself to do anything and else. And guess what? Physiologically, your body will respond in kind. Yeah. You won't remember, you won't learn, you won't do this, you won't do that because your body will respond in kind. But understanding that, no, our neuroplasticity is there, our ability to learn new things, to change things. And he talks about that as well, this book as well, which is really, really important. And when we understand we have the ability to change that, then things will change. So yeah. it's all about change. It's all about paying attention, having that connectedness to ourselves, and then making those changes to become the person that we truly should be, and undoing that person that we thought we were. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff today. So anyway, we hope that you guys liked it and appreciate it. And so once again, if you are interested in either of those two books, The Audacity to Be Queen, that is by Gina DeVee, and this breaking the Habit of Being Yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Really great books. Yes. And as always, you can find us at our website, twogirlsinapod.com. Please subscribe. You'll get an email anytime we post a new episode. If you do that, it's free to subscribe. And we, you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram under Two Girls in a Pod Life's Journey. And then there is also Adventures of Two Girls in a Pod Life's Journey on, on YouTube. YouTube. So we ask that you support us. It's really important. We all know how this works. This That word algorithm, which I still, it's black magic, people. <laughs> but we have to play with the black magic anyway. So anyway, we appreciate you. We thank you so much for joining us. And we will be back next week. So just be aware. Continue on that journey of being your authentic self. And thank you once again. Bye. Bye.